So as we're waiting to get started, just a little bookkeeping. <laughs> uh, there are a couple of good references for anyone on, and I'll mention these again at the end. Uh, for those of our families from Partners in Pediatrics, you're aware of this book. Um, a lot of folks are asking about integrated things they can do to help soothe their kids, um, help promote wellness, help care for them and illnesses. And one of the books that, um, that we have at Partners in Pediatrics is Naturally Healthy Kids. That's, um, that's a book we give to all of our families who come to Partners in Pediatrics. It's also available commercially too, but it has a good chapter on um, stress that has been used quite a bit these past few weeks. Another great resource for families, and uh, the author is here with us tonight on our panel, and that is um, Obvious Parenting. And this is written by Ben Jessen, who's one of our physician assistants who will be on the uh, panel for us tonight. It's Seven Simple Keys to Supporting Wellness. It's a very straightforward, easy to read um, guide to help families kind of recenter uh, with regard to nutrition, exercise, spirituality, just general health, teaching responsibility. So I'll mention those again at the end of our evening, but I wanted to get that in. Welcome everybody to our presentation, Coping with COVID. And we are very well aware as pediatricians and as providers, uh, we are very well aware of the challenges that you've all been going through and we've been listening. And this came to pass today because of our families who've been asking for questions. And thanks to the generosity and excitement um, and cooperation of Children's Hospital, I wanna thank Dr. Jessica Hawks, who's going to be our speaker tonight. She's a psychologist with Children's Hospital. I'll introduce her a little bit more. She's, um, and also I wanna thank Stacy Fox, who's our practice representative from Children's Hospital, who helped get this going. And then Ben Rose, who's working with Partners in Pediatrics to help coordinate this as well. So thank you to all of them. Um, our our um, attendees tonight, I wanna to just make sure you're muted as you're listening to the presentation. Uh, you will have an opportunity to ask questions near the end of the presentation. Listen carefully because many of our families have already submitted some questions that I know Dr. Hawks is going to work into the presentation. Um, if you do want to submit a question, there's a chat feature off to the side. You can type that in and we'll either hang on to that for the panel or try to answer it as we go or try to get to you at some point. Officially, we'll end at 8 p.m., but if there are a number of questions still outstanding, a few of us will be able to stay on to help for just a few more minutes. So, uh, without further ado, let me go ahead and just quickly introduce my team. I'm Nancy Latitis. I'm um, a partner and pediatrician at Partners in Pediatrics. I have two grown children uh, who are currently working from home in their cities. I have nieces and nephews who've just headed back out to college after lots of advice from Aunt Nancy about how to stay healthy and why that's so important, and two grand nieces who are going to be um, schooled from home this year as per their family's choice as well. And it is a difficult decision. Um, every family's different and you need to trust your instincts about making that decision. With me tonight is another mom and pediatrician, Meg Harleen. Meg is... Um, a graduate of Brigham Young University, Texas A&M Health Science Center College of Medicine. She is, um, she is a mom and a fabulous pediatrician. She has two daughters, age two and five. She's had a lot of experience with postpartum depression and adolescent screening for mental health disorders. And we really appreciate having her join us tonight. I also have Dana McHale, who's one of our physician assistants. She's been with Partners in Pediatrics for 17 years. She is a graduate of University of Denver and University of Colorado School of Medicine. And she is the mother of four daughters, two teenagers and 11-year-old twin daughters. She's been a policy advisor on COVID practices at some of her daughter's schools and at her church. So she's well aware of some of the issues you're going through uh, with return to school and activities. Um, Kendra Balsiger 
is one of our physician assistants. She's a former track star at, at CSU and then decided to become a physician assistant um, through the University of Colorado's program. She has an almost two-year-old daughter and is pregnant and due again. So if there are interesting questions about pregnancy and COVID, I think she's our go-to person tonight as well. Stephanie Levine is uh, from Idaho. She has a passion for volleyball. She attended University of Iowa Carver School of Me College of Medicine where she uh, completed their physician assistant program. And she has two darling daughters as well and has a lot of experience these past few months with decisions about daycare and home and safety and comfort with that. She's been a great um, source of, of help with that. Um, ben Jessen is the author of Obvious Parenting. He is one of our wonderful physician assistants and the, uh, has had some experience with homeschooling and is also raising two amazing young men who are high school age. So uh, he will be with us tonight too. And um, our main speaker tonight is Dr. Jessica Hawks. And I, we are very, very thankful that she agreed to help Partners in Pediatrics present this presentation tonight. She is a clinical um, child and adolescent psychologist and the clinical director of ambulatory services at the Pediatric Mental Health Institute at Children's Hospital. She is also an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry School of Medicine, where she provides outpatient mental health services to children, adolescents, and families, presenting with a wide variety of mental health concerns. She is active in teaching and she's active as a regular guest lecturer in the community. And for that, we are very, very thankful. She received her bachelor's degree, master's degree, educational specialist degree, and doctoral clinical degree of clinical psychology from Utah State, completed pre-doctoral internship here at Children's Hospital, and her postdoc fellowship at Cleveland Clinic Children's, which is another fabulous center for children. And without further ado, we bring you Dr. Jessica. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for taking time out of your night and with your families to spend with me uh, to talk about a very important and timely topic around COVID and just how we can work together to support our kids through this really difficult time. Um, so thank you so much to Partners in Pediatrics for inviting me. I am very excited to be here tonight. So Vernon, that's not gonna help me because I'm not a child. I so just act like one. So I am ready to going to share my screen here real fast. Can everybody see that? Perfect, okay. So um, I like to start off, um, I would like to start off tonight's conversation with a caveat that everything that I'm about to talk about is challenging um, to do at any time as a parent, but especially during a pandemic. And I think that as parents, we have been challenged more so than we could have possibly ever imagined to hold so many more roles than we would have ever thought that we would have to do, including being a parent, but also being an educator, being a therapist, being a friend, um, being kind of everything that we possibly could have to be to our kids because of just the really unique nature of what this pandemic has brought to us. And so more than anything, if you get one message out of tonight, it's really to just be compassionate towards yourself and towards others because we are all just doing the very best that we can in extraordinary circumstances. And my hope for tonight is that I can highlight first just some of the common themes and trends that we're seeing during the pandemic, um, but also more than anything, focus on what we can do to support our kids um, in the pandemic broadly, but also I think in some of the unique challenges that have come about from the pandemic, um, some of which I included in my presentation based on questions that families have already submitted. So I will talk um, a little bit about returning to school because that's obviously a really important and timely conversation to be having right now. Uh, there's also been some questions regarding screen time um, and just coping in general. And so I'll definitely be hitting on a little bit of that. Um, so with that, let's jump in. So first I just wanted to highlight some of the unique challenges that COVID has brought. These are not things that anybody is going to find um, surprising to be on the, the list because you've all been dealing with them for many months now. But I would categorize the unique challenges of COVID into three separate categories. The first one is just related to stress and anxiety. 
there's a lot of stress just related to COVID-19 in general. We know so little still about what this um, is going to bring as far as our health and our loved one's health, but also just the impact it's having on society. But for kids specifically, they're having additional stresses and anxieties about school, about what the future is going to bring for them. Um, for adults, we're having a lot more worries about finances. A lot of adults have had struggles with job insecurity and just some of the difficulties that come along with that. And then, like I mentioned before, parents, many parents are having to work from home. I know here at Children's as well as the university, there's a lot of conversation going on right now about how do we support employees and being able to balance now having uh, their kids be at school and how can we help them work from home or what are the other options. But working from home comes with its own unique set of challenges and stressors as many of you probably know. If we think about mood concerns, one of the biggest things that we're seeing for kids and teens is the, just the grief of important milestones. So we saw a lot of this with seniors this last spring where graduations weren't able to happen, senior prom wasn't able to happen, um, for individuals that are younger, perhaps is participating in organized sports or being able to transition to middle school or high school. These are all important milestones that kids and teens look forward to their whole life. And there was unfortunately a lot of things that had to be put on hold just to keep us all safe. Another major thing that's causing mood concerns is just the amount of social isolation that people have been experiencing. I know as adults, we certainly have experienced that, but for kids and teens, their social networks are their primary networks of supports. And to not be able to see them for weeks and months at a time, other than through um, technology has been very, very difficult for them. And the ability to be able to get creative and connecting has been super important for people's mental health, but that can still be really difficult. And the other major challenge that we've seen with COVID that has caused some mood related concerns for kids and teens is just how to have a structured schedule when everything feels so unstructured and so unpredictable. And this is going to be particularly important as we go into the school year. And I'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later on tonight. And the final thing I'll mention as far as unique challenges is just increased conflict between family members. It's normal to have conflict when you're in a time of stress. And so it is not unreasonable or problematic necessarily that we're seeing that increased conflict because there's a lot of changing dynamics. Like I mentioned, parents have been able to take on a lot of different roles over the last five or six months, including having to be extension of educators in the spring kind of overnight. And that led to a lot of challenges because kids had to listen to their parents in a whole different way. And parents had to navigate a system that they weren't necessarily completely familiar with either on top of working at the same time. So it was really, really challenging for a lot of people. Um, unfortunately, one of the things we've seen on the extreme end in this particular category is that we are seeing more um, significant portrayals of conflict between family members specific to increased um, non-accidental injury or abuse that has happened with kids. And a lot of times this is simply a reflection on parents and the amount of stress that they're currently under. And it's an important reminder for all of us to just be aware of the need to be very cognizant of how our stress is impacting us and how it's impacting the ways in which we might, re might be responding to our children so that we don't engage in any kind of behaviors that we might regret that might cause harm. So for those that experience um, difficulties during any kind of major stressor, we kind of categorize them into two places. We've got the normative responses to stress and the things I just talked about, those are all normative stressors in the context of this pandemic. But there is going to be a subset of kids that are going to have more significant emotional and behavioral responses to the stressors associated with COVID. And I just wanna highlight some of the important warning signs for parents to be aware of so that they can be observing their children and the behaviors that they may or may not be engaging in so that we can notice any red flags early on. Um, and towards the end of my presentation, I'll highlight a couple of resources that parents can access. I know that Partners in Pediatrics has also done a really wonderful job being quite progressive with regards to the ways in which they support the overall health of children. Um, and so I know they've got a lot of wonderful resources there as well. But some of the red flags that we want to be cognizant of when we are thinking about, is our child having mental health difficulties? 
Um, within the context of a pandemic, we know that the number one predictor for mental health concerns is going to be a past history of mental health concerns. So if your child has ever struggled with anxiety or depression or other kinds of emotional behavioral difficulties, um, they are going to be at increased risk of having some of those symptoms pop back up. And so that's an important thing to be aware of. But broadly, symptoms that you want to be looking for in your child is, do they seem more irritable or tearful than they used to? Or are they seeming to have a lot of difficulty managing worries um, or anxious thoughts that might be coming into their mind? And one of the best ways you can tell that is if they're asking you the same types of questions over and over again, seeking reassurance from you um, in a way that you've already answered that question, but it just doesn't seem to be landing in a way that makes them feel calmer. Uh, if your child is acting out more than they typically do, they're engaging in more excessive or significant tantrums. Uh, there seem to be significant changes to their sleeping or eating habits, and that can be on either end of the spectrum. They might be sleeping less or more, and they might be eating less or more. Uh, now, this is extra difficult to tease apart in a pandemic because I think we've all experienced some change to our sleeping and eating habits. Uh, I know here at work, people joke about the COVID-19, much like the freshman 10. Um, and so, you know, we all have probably engaged in less healthy eating and sleeping habits. But if we're seeing that as a consistent pattern over time, that's something to be paying attention to. If your child seems to be isolating more, spending more time in their room, obviously teens spend a lot of time in their room anyways, especially when everybody's been uh, stuck in the house together. But if it seems to be excessive um, or a difference from what your teen typically used to show, uh, that is something important to pay attention to. If they seem less motivated, we're gonna see a lot of this as we enter into the school year. Um, so if you've got a child who might be struggling with some emotional concerns, you might be more likely to see some of this as they start to have more demands placed on their day-to-day -day schedule. It's really common for kids, especially if they're depressed or anxious, to have a hard time concentrating. And so that can also be something to pay attention to if they're having a hard time completing their schoolwork. And then the last warning sign I'll mention is that they, if kids or teens seem to be having a hard time enjoying activities that they used to do. So for example, if they used to really enjoy going out riding their bike around the neighborhood and that's something that you're not seeing them do anymore, that's something that you might wanna just check in with and see if that might be an indication that they're having a hard time struggling emotionally. So one of the things that um, I think is important for us as parents to be thinking about is just how do we talk to our kids? You know, we've all been navigating pretty difficult conversations for a number of months now. And that all started with just like, what is COVID? And how is COVID impacting us? And now it's gonna expand into other topics like the fears about going back to school or as the community reopens, um, what are some of the fears associated with that? And so I just wanna provide some general guidance and suggestions about ways that you can more effectively talk with your kids. Um, the great thing about these suggestions is they're not specific to COVID. These are actually really good ideas to approach your kids about any difficult topic. Um, and so it's something that you can tuck away uh, in your parenting toolbox, regardless of whether we're in a pandemic or we're just going through normative childhood experiences, but the number one thing that parents are encouraged to do is just discuss these topics openly and in an ongoing fashion, but without forcing. So one of the most common things that I hear parents talk about when I work with families is they're afraid to bring up some of these topics because they're afraid that they might actually be planting ideas or worries into their kids' minds. And so they almost feel in an attempt to protect their child and be motivated to safeguard them from extra stress um, they try not to approach these topics. But what we know is that kids are very aware um, when difficult things are going on. Obviously with COVID, there is no hiding that that's happening um, because that has profoundly impacted all of us. So it's important to just approach these topics and ask your child if they want to talk about things um, and recognize that this is not going to be a one and done conversation. This is going to be an ongoing conversation because your child is likely to have these conversations with you marinate in them for a while, then they might have additional thoughts or questions that they want to talk to you about. So creating a culture at home where your children feel comfortable being able to approach you about these things can be really important. But on the flip side, we want to make sure that we're not forcing kids to talk. So um, if you ask your child, hey, do you want to talk about the fact that you're going back to school next week? Any worries or things that you want to talk through? And they say no, 
be okay with that. Um, you've set the stage and they now know that they can approach you if they have questions and you should continue to check in from time to time. Um, but we don't wanna force those conversations to happen if kids aren't ready. One of the best things to do when you're in these conversations is just try to take cues from your children. So try to follow their lead by asking them what kinds of questions they have rather than assuming that we know what they wanna know. Uh, it can be much more helpful to ask them what they're interested in knowing. And you'll be surprised. I'm constantly surprised when I'm working with children and asking them um, different questions. The angles and thoughts that they have are not what I expected a lot of times. They're in a completely different realm. And I think it's always illuminating to realize that. When it comes to the approach, I would break down the approach of how you talk to your kids in two different segments, one for children and then one for teens. With children, it's better to try to be brief, to use really simple developmental language, and to really focus on be, being reassuring. So for example, if I was talking about my child going back to school and they're, they're feeling nervous about that and what that might mean, um, what I'm gonna wanna do is focus on, you know, if they're going back to school, for example, versus online learning, I might say things like, the schools have done a really good job of taking all the information doctors have shared to keep us all safe. And we are going to make sure that we focus on the things that we can control, like making sure our mask stays on, making sure that we wash our hands, et cetera. With teens, it's important to actually be uh, honest and accurate and just providing factual information because teens have the internet readily accessible to them for the most part. And so they've probably already been Googling a lot of this information before they've even talked to you. And if we try to sugarcoat or mis um, present the information, teens will know that and they will become less trusting of us. So it's important for us to be open and honest, um, not providing more information than is necessary, but trying to stick with the facts. And even sometimes getting on the internet together and researching topics can be helpful because then you're able to model for them what is the information that you're looking for in a website to know if it's something that's based in fact and science or if it's based in fear. Other things you wanna think about when you're talking to your kids, you wanna be sure that you're empathizing first and foremost. Um, so that can be simple statements like, I hear that you're feeling really scared about going back to school or it makes sense why you're feeling anxious about um, you know, doing online learning. Just being able to acknowledge the emotion can be really powerful. We want to be reassuring without empty promises. So one of the things that um, parents really got in a tricky spot with at the beginning of COVID is promising things that we didn't actually have the ability to promise. So parents were saying things like, oh, I'm sure we'll be able to go back to school in a couple weeks when we didn't go back to school. And when we make those promises and then we're unable to follow through with them, kids become less trusting of us. So we wanna be reassuring, um, but not promising things that we can't. As a parent, one of the most important things you can do, and this is across all the topics we'll talk about tonight, is make sure that you're dealing with your own anxieties or stress or worries related to any of these topics. Because the number one way that kids are gonna look to cope is by watching you. And parents have a profound impact on the ways in which kids look and navigate their worlds. And if they see us as parents seeming calm, comfortable, reassured, they're more likely to become those things as well. But if they overhear parents talking about how the school doesn't have their act together, or um, you know this is gonna go on forever, or all the different stressors that we might as adults be experiencing and would be completely appropriate to talk about outside the earshot of our kids. We wanna make sure that we're not talking about those things in front of them and really modeling that um, security and confidence in, um, in the society and educational systems that we're working in. And then like I mentioned, we really wanna focus conversations on things that we can control. So social distancing, wearing masks, um, you know, washing our hands, doing the kinds of things that we know that have been tried and tried, tested in studies now that tell us things that we can improve our um, physical uh, well-being, as far as emotional well-being as well. So focusing on the things that we can do just to take care of ourselves in general. As far as coping with COVID, we've all been in the midst of coping with COVID for many months. So I imagine uh, many families are already doing a lot of this, but just like to highlight some of the things that are important. Uh, I 
joke at work a lot of times with my colleagues that we ran a marathon at a sprint's pace at the beginning of all this. And so within just a couple of weeks, we had transformed you know, all of our clinics into telehealth services, for example, and that was kind of a 24 seven job for a couple of weeks. And then once things started to settle and the dust started to settle, we recognized that this was not going to be just a couple weeks or a couple months effort. This was gonna likely be you know, for at least the rest of 2020 effort, but people were pretty worn out. And I saw the same thing with parents. Parents really buckled down and tried to support their kids. Like, let's just get through the current school year. Let's get to May. Let's get you graduated. Let's just kind of get through the toughest part. And then the dust started to settle a little bit and we all adjusted to this new normal. But the reality is, is that we're still in this new normal for the indefinite future and people are feeling really tired. And so I think that's important just to be reminding yourself of that, like, if you're really exhausted and feeling pretty burnt out, that's understandable because we didn't realize how long this was going to go on for. And we expended a lot of energy trying to cope at the beginning, maybe not appreciating how long this was going to go on. Some of the things that we can continue to do to cope um, for the foreseeable future, continue to limit how much news your kids and even yourselves are being exposed to. I know for myself at the beginning of pandemic, I was pretty addicted to the news and looking at all the statistics that were coming out and all the new studies. And it gets to a point where that information becomes less helpful and actually more harmful because you're just constantly thinking about a very stressful topic. So it's okay to be informed, but you don't wanna obsess over news. Um, take news breaks and turn your TV off from time to time and allow yourself to be doing other things that don't necessarily have to be focused on the pandemic. For, especially for coping for our kids, we wanna make sure as adults we're available. And that's really hard to do with all the different hats that parents have been juggling, um, especially if you're working from home. But try to make sure that you're available when your kids are home and with you so that you can have those conversations that we were just talking about. Already mentioned healthy modeling as adults is really important. A daily schedule is critical for the healthy well-being of a kid always, but especially during the pandemic. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about this as we're talking through transitioning back to school, but the importance of a daily schedule cannot be overstated. Being able to try to keep your kids in a regular routine when it comes to mealtime and sleeping time and soon school time will be really critical to them. The more predictive our um, our lives can be as far as a child goes, the more emotionally stable we are going to be. We want to make sure that we're still having fun um, as families. And I know, again, this has been really hard to do because people have felt really, really stressed, understandably so. But we want to make sure that we're building in fun activities for our kids. And that will be more important than ever as they're transitioning back to school. And then finally, making sure that we're still engaging in social connections in whatever way that makes sense. Um, as some of the shutdown has lifted somewhat. We've been able to engage in some in-person social connections again, which I think has been really helpful, um, but the winter is going to bring what it brings and we may or may not be able to continue with that. And so making sure that we stay creative and making sure we stay connected um, is really critical. So some of the questions that got submitted to um, the practice was related to sleeping concerns. And so I wanted to just spend a couple of minutes talking about sleeping concerns and ways to potentially address that, especially as you're going back in to school. So sleeping concerns were going to be inevitable for some kids during the shutdown because schedules got kind of all disrupted significantly. So the first thing that we want to do if our kids are struggling with sleep is make sure that we are actually maintaining a regular sleep schedule for them. And this includes both wake up and sleep times especially for teens, their brains are just naturally gravitated towards being up at night and sleeping during the day. So if your teen has really flipped their sleep schedule over um, and upside down, know that that's normal and it's going to take some time and effort to be able to get them back to normal sleeping hours. But it's really important to start to try to make those efforts as quickly as possible before school really gets into full swing. For younger children and teens, it's important that we really minimize naps. Um, once naps are no longer developmentally needed, and the more we nap, especially later on in the afternoon and evening, the more disruptive that can be to our sleep at night. We wanna make sure that we're limiting screen use in the evening. Uh, being on screens really impacts certain things in our brains that make us sleepy. And so the more that we can be off screens as bedtime is approaching, 
the better. This is particularly challenging for teens because their phones are their lifeline and they really have a hard time giving them up at night. Um, and they will argue that they use them for their alarms or for listening to music at night, et cetera. And that might be true. And if they're having a hard time sleeping, it's something to just visit with your teen as to whether or not their phones are actually causing more problems than they're benefiting from. Uh, creating a bedtime routine can be really helpful for those that are struggling with sleep. So having a consistent sequence of events that happen really help communicate to our brain at the beginning of that sequence that bed is coming and can help to start make us tired. So if that includes, you know, taking a shower, reading a book, having cuddles with parents, whatever that might look like, but having the same type of thing happen each night leading up to bed can really be helpful. And then finally, and this is important even for us as adults to be doing, and even I fall victim to this from time to time, but we don't wanna use our bed for anything other than sleeping. Teens in particular are not great at this because they will sit in their beds for the good chunk of the evening, doing homework on it, talking to their friends, watching TV, surfing the internet, etc. And when we do that, our brains start to get really confused about what the bed is actually for. And conversely, if we only get in bed to sleep, as soon as we get into bed, our brains are like, oh, I know what to do here. There's one thing that I do here and it will start to get sleepy. So if you're noticing that your child's having sleeping concerns, uh, visit with them what they're doing in their beds. And if they're doing a lot of different things in their bed, try to get creative with other places in their home that they can do those things. All right, so I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about going back to school because this is obviously a really important topic right now as many schools have started in just this last week going back. Um, and every school district and even school within a school district is doing this differently. And we get a lot of questions up here at Children's about what is the right decision? Because a lot of families are given options as to, do I go full online? Do I go full in person? Do I do some sort of hybrid? And I think the most important thing to know is that there is no right answer here. It's a difficult choice. And more than anything, we wanna make sure that you are making these decisions based on what is best for your family. But here at Children's, there's a couple of guidelines that we recommend that you think about as you're weighing the different options of going back in person versus being online, if those are options available to you as a parent. Just different things to be assessing, and this will be an ongoing assessment. So this isn't gonna just be happening at the beginning of the school year, but probably ongoing throughout the school year, is to consider the following. Think about within your immediate community, how is COVID looking? Uh, are we seeing an increase in cases within your respective neighborhoods and communities? And if so, that's something to think about. What is the risk of getting COVID at school? So thinking about what the school is doing to make sure that they are following the guidelines that have been provided to reduce risk as much as possible, what kinds of screening is being done, are they doing social distancing, are they requiring masks, et cetera. You wanna be thinking about your child's risk of COVID. So does your child have any unique health conditions that might make them at increased risk of COVID? And certainly that would be something that would potentially guide you to making different choices, as well as if there's a family member that lives at home with you that might be at risk of COVID due to um, their own health conditions. And then finally, be thinking about some of the challenges with remote learning. So obviously remote learning has the benefit of reducing exposure to COVID and it comes with certain concessions, especially for certain students that might have uh, specific needs that are more going, going to be better met by going to school. So for example, if you have a child who has a 504 plan or a uh, individualized education plan and getting special education services of any type, while the schools are getting really creative and trying to find ways to provide those services remotely, it is more difficult. Um, and it may require us to have less access to some of those supports throughout the school year. We obviously are going to be um, reducing the amount of social connections we have throughout the day when we're unable to go to school in person. And school, while education is obviously the top priority, some of the social emotional developing um, skills that kids learn happen best at school. And so that's something that's going to have to be uh, considered when making these decisions. And then finally, we know that there are going to be increased mental health risks if kids are unable to go to school in person. So it's not that these things are deterrents from doing remote learning. They're just things to weigh in the different 
factors that we have to think about when we're thinking about going back to school. And if we choose to continue to pursue that remote learning option, I think it's still just helpful to think about these are things that you'll want to be more aware of and noticing those red flags I talked about earlier with mental health concerns, for example, or getting creative with ways to connect with your social networks. If you do end up going virtual, and it, that seems to be more the case for students that we're working with up here at Children's than not, um, there's some recommendations that I just want to highlight as far as how do we help kids uh, engage in virtual learning successfully. So many parents got the trial by fire experience in the spring when many schools went to online learning very quickly. I think the schools learned a lot. I think we as parents learned a lot about ways to maybe set people up for success more this fall. But a couple of things to consider. One is just to get organized. The number one way uh, or the number one thing I would encourage parents to be thinking of when it comes to getting organized is to think about where in your home you could set up a quiet space for your child to work. We don't necessarily want our children on a laptop in all different places throughout the house while they're doing school. There's a real science behind um, context learning. And what that means is, is that we learn best when we're in an environment that predictably and consistently is a place that we learn. So if we can set up a desk or a quiet space somewhere in the home that allows your child to consistently work there, that becomes their school space. And that can be really helpful um, across the board for them. But other things to do to get, to get organized is to think about what are the platforms that your kids are going to need to access online, making sure that they know how to log in, navigate those, etc. Um, it's really helpful for parents to reach out to teachers. I know teachers are feeling very overwhelmed right now and they're doing their best to communicate proactively, but if you have concerns or specific needs that your child has, make sure that you're reaching out to the teachers proactively to have those conversations. Uh, as I mentioned before, daily routines are critical um, always, but especially when you're doing remote learning because it can just get really difficult to have. Um, one of the things that's really important to be building into these routines though is breaks. So movement breaks, get away from the computer. For those of you that have been working remotely, uh, you can certainly um, empathize with just the technology burnout that happens. I'm on Zoom calls sometimes six, seven, eight hours a day, and there's a real tax in sitting in front of a computer for that many hours, especially for a kid whose attention span is much smaller. So make sure that you're breaking up their day and giving them a chance to step away from the computer and move around a little bit. But the other thing to think about, especially for young kids with routine, um, we know from educational research that actually the first six weeks that teachers are introducing their kids to school, a primary focus is actually on building those routines of their day to day. Because when we have routine mixed in with learning, our learning actually gets better. And so we want to do the same thing at home. And are there certain things that kids can do, for example, to kind of ease into the school day? Um, you know, one of the things that elementary school teachers oftentimes do is they'll have some floor time and they'll talk about like what the schedule for the day is going to look like or they might do attendance or they might talk about what the weather is going to be like today etc and if you can just do something very brief like that even if it's like over breakfast as part of the routine it can really help your kids start to ease into that mindset of what the school day is about to bring it is completely appropriate and encouraged actually to use incentives to motivate your kids to um, engage in online learning this is difficult. It's a difficult type of learning to engage in and it is completely appropriate to use incentives. Um, so for example, if you can get through your work or your school day and, and sit and complete your assignments over the next five or six hours, at the end of the day, we're going to go do blank thing together and have them looking forward to that at the end of the day. If possible, creating a transitional period between school and home life is important. We experience this as adults as well. If we can have a transition from work to home, we're just in a better mindset when we get home, and it's true for kids as well. So engaging like a fun activity together to help transition can be really great. Like I mentioned earlier, just talking with your kids about school can be really important, and then being a good role model. So if you're working from home, trying to make sure that you're also creating effective boundaries between work and home. I think one of the classic things that happened for parents this spring is that they didn't feel like they were doing a good job or being effective at anything, even though they were working around the clock at everything. And that is partly because we were engaged in so many different roles throughout those couple of months. 
and kids watch us and they they learn by watching us and so making sure that we set boundaries of when I'm going to be working and when I'm going to be a parent can be really important. The last thing I'll talk about just real briefly is screen time. This is a question that I get a lot right now uh, because kids whole life has been virtual um, in connecting with their friends and doing school uh, and watching TV, everything. So first and foremost, it is reasonable and understandable that kids are going to have more access to screens right now. I think that's just, it's going to happen. I think as parents just coming to a place of being okay with that, I think is, a, is reasonable. Um, we're not gonna be able to do the like two hours max of screen time recommendation that the American Academy of Pediatrics typically recommends because everything is online right now. But that's not to say that we can't still have parameters. Um, even if those parameters didn't exist at the beginning of the COVID shutdown, um, and if you start to set those parameters, kids will frequently react to that because they're not going to like it. And so having those conversations and really thinking about what those parameters look like for you as a family are important. And there's no one size fits all, and that's important to just be aware of. But as much as you can, use screens purposefully. So use screens to connect with friends and family. Um, be purposeful in the type of content that your kids and teens are accessing. If it can be higher quality, educational, uh, etc. That can be really beneficial type of screen use. Use media together. So like I mentioned, sit down with your teens and research topics together. You can help to model the types of um, effective ways of navigating that information when you do things like that. Talk with your teachers, your kids' teachers, about the kinds of offline activities that they can be doing so that everything doesn't have to be online all the time. They could do some paper-based worksheets, for example. And like I mentioned, limits are still important. And feel empowered to set those limits with your kids. They are important. Limits are still important for our children even during a pandemic. These are just a couple of resources that um, I wanted to highlight. Children's Hospital Colorado's website has a phenomenal um, whole list of resources as well as websites um, that have been created to talk about a number of different topics that parents are wondering about right now. So certainly feel free to visit that website. But there are some additional apps that are really helpful that people have been accessing throughout the pandemic. Headspace and Calm are two of my favorites. Um, Headspace is typically one that costs money, but the design, the developers have actually allowed it to become an, a free app during the pandemic to help support families, which has been really appreciated by a lot of folks. As far as community resources, particularly if your child is struggling with mental health concerns, um, please feel free to reach out. It's better to be proactive and not wait for those concerns to get worse. We are seeing a huge surge in mental health concerns right now, um, and that has stayed pretty consistent since the pandemic hit. So we know that this is happening. We are here and available to support you in whatever ways we can. The number next to the Children's Hospital Colorado um, line is the direct number to our mental health services here at Children's, and you can call that number and be routed to whatever types of mental health services you're looking for. The Colorado Crisis Services is another really wonderful resource, the resource that the state has, and that is a number that you can call 24-7. There's also a text option. If you get on their website, you can actually text them, um, and this has been really beneficial for a lot of teens who might not feel comfortable talking on the phone, but will feel comfortable texting uh, somebody that can provide some support. And then my absolute favorite website, other than our Children's Hospital Colorado website, of course, is the Child Mind Institute website. This website is absolutely phenomenal. It is chock-a-block full of resources for parents to be able to read and watch. They also do daily uh, Facebook chats with families to bring up whatever questions they have. And these are all manned by licensed mental health professionals. Um, and they've got a lot of really, really wonderful stuff on there. So I definitely recommend reaching out um, or looking at that website. And with that, I have not been looking at the chat at all. So I don't know what questions have come up, but I'm going to stop sharing this PowerPoint. And um, I, Stacy, were you? I don't know who was fielding questions, but I'm just going to open it up for questions and whatever um, concerns or thoughts people have had come up as we've been chatting. Okay, Jessica, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Loaded with information that a lot of our families have had questions about. Um, thank you, folks. I'm going to go ahead and start by asking a couple of my panelists some questions. Uh, we had some good questions about 
challenging conversations with young adults. Um, I know we've seen a few of them out with their own groups partying uh, together, no mask. We've seen a few of them very angry, very pessimistic, loss of hope in the future. Um, and frankly, if they're looking around and seeing some hypocrisy, there's this attitude of why should anything I happen to do matter? So uh, with that in mind, I'm going to ask Dana and Ben to unmute and talk a little bit about experience with, um, with dealing with teenagers and young adults, and what tips they might have. Dana, you're going first, you want me to go? You can go ahead. That's a tough question. I that would. is a tough question. Because we're all, they're all in different places. Is a teenager um, from being more anxious about things, being more depressed about things, more rebellious about things. So it really depends on what the specific situation is. But I think as a parent of two teenage boys, I think that what I have to do is sit back, step back, take that breath and get um, an understanding of where they're coming from and not answering in a reactive way. I think maybe as a guy as well, um, that, that's a tendency that I, I could be drawn to is going, hey, um, I'm not looking at their point of view and I'm just gonna get frustrated because they're not agreeing with me. And that's one thing you don't wanna do with teenagers, it will never work. I think too, I tend to wanna fix the situation and start talking my advice line and they just shut off with that or immediately react and to try to ask questions maybe about what they've been doing, if that may be, I don't know, try to get outside themselves, like how it might affect others around them maybe, but just to ask a lot of questions to see if you can figure out the motivation about maybe why they acted that way. But probably Dr. Hawks might have advice for us too. <laughs> I think you guys did a wonderful job covering it. I, I would just I think agree with everything you just said. Yeah, I think if you can figure out what motivates them, what are their dreams and what motivates them, you can sometimes help guide them back into, um, gee, if you'd like to see school be an option for you, what are some things that will be important to keep you healthy so you're able to pass that COVID test and go you know, to school? What are some things about um, what you're gonna need to save for? This is a dream for you. How might you meet that goal? Um, so just instead of telling them what to do, just asking them what's important because they are able. And if we try to tell them what to do, we're kind of telling them we don't have confidence that they're an adult and they are capable of making those decisions. Um, we need to let them know we do think they can do it. We're here to listen and ask questions. So, um, let me move on. We had a good question about how do you tell when special needs kids are really struggling? You can tell something's off, but are there any tips or um, any things that might help with that? And I'm gonna ask Meg and Kendra to unmute and see if you can pass on any pearls. Well, some of the thoughts that I had on that is, you know, special needs children in and children in general, they, um, do they really pick up on our own anxiety? So I think we need to first embrace our anxiety um, because they will react to our feelings and we serve as role models about how to best manage that anxiety. And so I think it's helpful as parents to cultivate a positive and, and hopeful mindset about the future. But at the same time, I think we also need to be able to confront the worst case scenario. So if there's something that they're scared about, don't ignore it, but address it and say, you know, what would happen? You know, how would you feel if this happened? Just so that they can kind of work through that, um, you know, those feelings in case it does happen because as parents, we don't have full control of the situation. Um, and I think a lot of times just kind of developing a sense of humor um, can be really helpful, um, talking about difficult things um, and, uh, you know, building a good support system can also be helpful because, different people can, um, you know, reach children in different ways. So, you know, you may be able to talk to a parent differently than, you know, a close family friend. Um, so just having 
uh, different people check in with your children can be very helpful. And then, of course, through all of this, we want to be able to savor the good moments. We don't want to focus on all the all the stress and the anxiety, but we want to also remember that even during the time of a pandemic, um, you know, positive things can happen, and um, you know, try to focus on on those things so that children can have good memories, you know, during this time. That's yeah, great. I would agree with a lot of what Meg said, um, as well as you know, just making sure that we're being flexible as well. Um, and I think you know it was kind of talked about already. Um, but with special needs kids, you really have to have, you know, a good routine for them. Um, and I have a special needs nephew who is dealing with a lot of these different changes right now. So as much as they can, you know, keeping his routine normal is important. Um, and also, it's okay to, you know, have these kids, they can be frustrated and they can have periods of, um, you know, anger and that's okay, you know, and that's normal. But then we need to make sure that we're doing things to kind of, um, help them work out of that, you know, whether that's music or deep breaths or just some of the coping mechanisms, you know, warm baths, um, just for them to be able to come out of those kind of frustration periods, which are normal, but um, just, yeah, working through some of that. It sounds like part of the question is just how do you identify if um, a special, a child with special needs might be um, struggling and I think one of the things to just be very aware of is that a lot of times when a child is struggling with school they're not always able to just say that and so we really have to pay attention to their behaviors because they might not even realize that's what's going on for themselves so if you see your child struggling a lot more on Sunday nights than you do on Saturdays um, that's a good indication that there might be some anticipatory anxiety or if it's happening every morning where your child's having a meltdown that's also a potentially good sign that there's something about transitioning to school that can be really difficult. Um, I think it feels harder right now to access some of the special education services if your child's not at school and the school systems are still responsible for supporting your children as, as much as they are physically able to and so reaching out to the school proactively and trying to have these conversations in an ongoing way to really get creative. I know that educators are very committed to supporting all students and I've seen some really creative solutions already to help um, those that might have unique learning styles and so just making sure you're partnering with the school and realizing that they are a source of support even though they're also feeling overwhelmed um, and they might not seem as readily accessible. We have a question about um, setting up schedules and several people have been interested in that. How do you get that to work out? How do you stick to it? Often parents have to have their schedules too. So um, I'm gonna ask Stephanie and Ben. Ben's had some experience with home instruction. Can you comment on those? Yeah, my kids are younger, but I think um, even for the, the young kids, um, being able to kind of anticipate some things um, and, and give them guidance beforehand. Um, you know, for me right now, it's small things like you have five more minutes to play, we're going to set an alarm, and when that goes off, it's time to clean up. Um, so for school time, um, it may be things like a chore chart or, a, or like a school chart, essentially, right? Um, here are the things that you need to accomplish today. Um, and we have a checklist for you. Um, maybe we do set timers and say, hey, here's our, here's our math class time. Um, and it doesn't mean that they can't go back and finish their work. It doesn't mean it's, a, a, you know, it's not a, a penalty or anything like that. It's just um, setting up expectations beforehand um, to help keep everyone on track um, and have um, a sense of normalcy because their class, you know, especially for the older kids, their class schedules you know, they have 45 minutes per class or whatever it is in the classroom anyway. Um, and so maybe trying to keep something like that. Um, and I don't know if setting a bell for them is, you know, a good thing or if it's anxiety provoking for some, but maybe for some it does help kind of with that transition. Um, and you give them that five minutes between those periods like they would to walk through the hallway or, you know, something small like that that could just really help with that transition and change their mindset. Okay, I'm gonna go from math to social studies. Um, whatever it may be, but sometimes something, something like that might be helpful, um, helpful reminder. Yeah, it seems like the older they get, the more they're going to want to know, not just what's going on today, but also through the week, and especially with parent schedule and these hybrid mo models that are coming out, 
it's gonna be really important to kind of sit down maybe on Sunday, pretty much every night actually, and to say, this is what's coming um, tomorrow. Uh, you're gonna be home tomorrow, you're not gonna be at school tomorrow. Um, and right now, of course, we really don't know how the online learning is gonna go through these schools. So we have to keep that anxiousness down and talk through and go, hey, we're just gonna have to roll with it until we see what's going on. But once that schedule starts getting into a rhythm, it is really important to do not just the, the daily check-in, but hey, this week in the broad spectrum, this is where we're at. This is when I'm gonna be wet work and I'm not gonna be home if that's the case, which is good, often is gonna be the case. Um, daily through homeschooling my kids for so long, yeah, setting a schedule with the big dry erase board and it's big and it's central and you can just check off what's next. If you know the schedule already, um, what you're gonna do with the kids. And then like we said, uh, like Jessica said, is that it's important to have those breaks, those physical get your body moving breaks it makes a huge difference with the kids to do that so um, and that's going to be helpful too when the time comes when we need to start this all up the other thing i'll add is that just going back and forth from preferred to non-preferred activities can be really helpful especially for younger kids so rather than making them just power through six hours of school allow them to do like an hour of school and then take a break or if they like a certain topic more than another one in school like letting them rotate back and forth can help kind of keep that momentum going so that they don't feel frustrated for long periods of time i was going to say in the spring at the very beginning there wasn't a lot of structure at all and i made i let them pick what subject they could do when and then we all had like a lunch time and they could go outside and then we even listed off the things that would be count as recess kind of. So jump on the trampoline or we go on a walk, but maybe for some of you parents, you're working at home, that gives them at least two subjects to do. And then maybe you check back in at lunch and then give them, you know, because I can't imagine trying to balance your own work schedule and, you know, supervising your kids. So yeah, breaking it up into chunks and we let them pick the order. And I think that worked well. And then for incentives, we did end up doing that at the beginning, especially because some of the kids didn't even get grades. I don't know where your grades were frozen. We don't really know what that's gonna look like for this coming school year, but um, we did utilize that at our house as well. And it could even be something that you normally might do, but I let them pick which drive through we were gonna go through, or um, we made a target run or something for something for their school area to decorate or make it fun. So I know just little things that I think maybe you would do normally, but let them choose, really gave them, I think, the opportunity to feel in control about something that was really out of their control. And I just saw a note pop up, um, questions about some incentive type rewards uh, to gain compliance for the younger kids. Um, just two small things. Um, one thing that I kind of like, um, and it may or may not work well school-wise, but um, a marble jar, if they're old enough, obviously not for very young children, that could be a choking hazard. Um, but um, the idea that if you do something positive, you put something in the jar, and if you do a behavior that's negative or not something that your family, um, um, you know, the, the way you want your things to go, um, you take the marble out of the jar. So it's a very visual way to say, um, look, I filled my jar up with really positive things. So maybe for, for class time, it's, hey, I finished this, this project or I finished this assignment or something like that, just so they can say, hey, I'm accomplishing something. Um, and then um, the other thing, um, full disclosure, my sister is a kindergarten teacher. So the one thing that they use in their classroom is green light, yellow light, red light. Um, so you start out, everybody's at a green light because everybody's having a great day. Um, and so I think that's one thing to, to note is that this is gonna be a great day for everybody. You know, we start out very positively. Um, and hey, if something maybe, man, we had a really rough go and you know, something you know, didn't go the way it was supposed to, we were being kind of negative, whatever. Um, we, we have a negative behavior, we move down to yellow light. Um, and it's just a very visual way of them saying, of, of showing kind of where we're at that day and how things are going. Um, so that's something you could try. One thing I'll just add for incentives, I think parents can sometimes feel really overwhelmed at just the 
what feels like the sheer energy and resource that has to go into creating like a behavior chart, for example, it just feels like completely unsustainable for folks, which is completely reasonable. So one of the things that I like to recommend for parents is how do you create like this kind of a culture that's almost just like a part of the family home. So like, for example, as a, as a Dana, I loved all your examples of like ways that kids could be in control because kids don't feel like they've got control over hardly anything right now. So even being able to say stuff like, hey, if you can get through school today and finish all your assignments and stay seated while you've got to be in class, at the end of the day, you get to pick what we have for dinner. And here are the list of 10 options available to you. So that they really have some like, it's it's integrated into the family's day to day. It's not like we have to have, um, you know, a whole treasure chest of trinkets and prizes because that just isn't sustainable for a lot of families to do that. It's more like what's in the day-to-day -day that kids can maybe have control over that they don't usually get to. Uh, another one that a lot of kids love is like you had to build a fort in the living room on Friday night and have a sleepover in there. Like it's like things like that that don't cost money but they're fun and they're novel and that makes kids feel motivated to get access to them. Another good question that I would love to hear Dr. Hawk's opinion about too, and that is, uh, it's been very real. You know, we're human beings. We are accustomed to hugs and being close. And when we're little, that's a really important part of our um, endorphin release and of our oxytocin release and all of these other little chemical things that help us live and be human and create love and loving memories. How do we help our young children who are missing that close contact with their friends get through this period? Yeah, I, so yeah, absolutely. I think we're all grieving that in different ways. Um, you know, even as adults, like I miss being able to hug people um, or even shake hands with patients when I get to meet them, like just basic stuff like that. I think we're, we're all, you know, social creatures. I think being able to talk about it is the most important thing that you can do. Just acknowledging that like this is really hard and even saying that for yourself as, as a parent, like I feel sad that I don't get to hug my friends. Um, being able to just give them language for that is really helpful and really powerful. That ability just to empathize with how hard what we're going through right now is. Um, and then making sure that if your child's one of their love languages is physical contact, making sure that maybe you're extra cognizant to give them some of that. Make sure you're giving them extra hugs, um, you know, giving them opportunities to have physical contact with those that it's okay to have physical contact with right now. And just making sure you create those opportunities can be really helpful. Um, I want to point out it is eight o'clock and we had promised you all an hour program. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Jessica Hawks so much for giving her time and her energy and her expertise to help share with our families tonight. We are having a tough time. And I want to thank Stacy Fox for helping this all happen tonight. Um, I want to thank my panel and a few of us are willing to stay on a few minutes to answer some more questions. As those pop up, uh, I know some have to depart and put kids to bed and get kids back to their challenges, but um, a few of us will stay on. And your questions have been great. The ones we did not get a chance to get to, we'll try to answer in the next few minutes. Um, for those of you who have not yet had an opportunity to get in to see your primary care provider, whether it's at Partners in Pediatrics or your own pediatrician, I encourage you please call, please get in. A very big important part of well care right now is screening for mental health issues. And if your pediatrician isn't doing that, ask them, how do I know? How do I know? Uh, there's some really great screens that most pediatricians are employing now for children when we have concerns. And pediatricians can help you pick up on this, help you decide when your child needs to see a specialist and help put you in touch with those very important psychologists, psychiatrists, licensed clinical social workers, et cetera. Also, this is an opportunity. While our COVID cases are so low in, in Colorado right now, thank you everybody for wearing your mask and distancing. What, this is a great opportunity to get in, to catch up on immunizations. What we don't wanna see happen this fall is struggling with COVID and the flu and whooping cough and other vaccine preventable illnesses. So definitely uh, get online, call, 
get your kids in for well care. And we can help you with all of this. We really, truly can. So thank you, Dr. Hawks. We appreciate you so much. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, to the panel who has, to the members of the panel who have to depart, thank you for your time. I'll be willing to stay on a few extra minutes and I'll look at the chat questions and see if we can help answer those. Thanks so much for having me, everybody. It was wonderful spending our evening together and stay safe out there. This will be recorded. We hope to have access to this to provide to our partners and pediatrics families. Children's Hospital has fabulous resources for those of you who wanna to go to their site, um, including some uh, written material and some podcasts. So um, there's help, there's help. And we had one question, how long is this going to go on? Um, be prepared for a marathon and anything short of getting back to normal in 2021, 2022. We may not be back to the regular normal for a really long time, but if we're preparing by taking care of ourselves and taking care of our families and taking it a day at a time and listening, uh, we'll get through this together. Thanks folks. I'll stay Bye. on. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, we had a question about uh, spacing. Dana, are you still there? I had a question about uh, DPS schools, and they're planning to do 35 per classroom and three foot spacing, and there was some alarm at that. I know you've helped a great deal with um, some of the planning for your schools and your church and going back. My understanding is that if it's a much bigger classroom, like a gymnasium or a cafeteria room, and you can space the kids at least three or more feet apart, they're facing the same direction and they're not yelling, talking, singing, that, that there is evidence that that's quite acceptable. Do you have any thoughts about that, Dana? Well, I think the guideline in Europe is one meter, which I, again, compare my metric to our American system, but I'm pretty sure that's less than six feet. And like, I know my kids, um, fifth grade teacher in Littleton Public Schools said their desks will be three feet apart. And that was what the class would afford. So I think, again, there's those really great guidelines that we've gotten from Children's Hospital and the Colorado Department of Health, and the schools are just trying to do the very best with what they have. But I, I, I'm, I felt okay with three feet because they're going to try to be wearing masks the whole time, washing their hands. Like you said, they're all faced. She showed us a picture of their classroom since parents aren't allowed to go in the school. And so I can kind of imagine what it's going to be like for them. And for me, it, it feels like it will be fine. I know we talk a lot about six feet, but again, they kind of have to be practical with the rooms that they have and the number of children. So I can appreciate how that sounds less, but I think it, it's still considered safe and that's part of the guidelines. Um, I have had some questions about resources for families who recognize now their kids need some help and they're beginning to call some of the specialists I know on the list that we've provided them. And there's some big, no big surprise here, some big wait lists for that. What are some things that families can do in the meantime um, to help us out with putting out the fires, helping them manage. Ben, I'm going to ask um, if you have some questions about that. Uh, Stephanie, I see you're still on as well. Help for, help for kids who really are needing some help but can't get in. What do we do until they can get into a therapist? Um, I think... Um... That's tough, obviously, um, but I think just um, developing some coping skills can be really helpful. Um, if there's some things that you know that your kids really enjoy doing or things that just generally um, can have helped previously when they've been going through some rough times, that can be helpful for some kids. It's music. Um, you can help teach some relaxation techniques, things like the five senses um, or deep breathing. Um, even some things like that, um, really trying to work on some of those things. Um, there's, you know, might seem small, um, but they can provide a big help. There were some resources that were provided on the presentation that can be really helpful. Um, Child Mind Institute, um, uh, for some kids doing like the Headspace app or Calm, um, some of those can be helpful. Um, um, so those can be some, just some resources um, when you're en route um, to getting with a therapist. 
Yeah, I think that also we just need to um, recognize that sometimes we have this, we have a list and it's a, sometimes an overwhelming list with for people and um, we can sometimes help out that if we, if we feel as a provider that we need to get this, this child in to see someone quicker, um, we, you know, we can advocate as well if it's needed sometimes. Uh, but sometimes it's just these therapists are overwhelmed um, and they have their own COVID protocols. And it seems like a lot of them are pretty strict. Um, and so we have to be understanding as the person waiting to get in to see these people and also as a provider that everyone's doing the best that they can. And that we, it's not like one, one time we're talking to someone that they're done. Sometimes we can be taught, you know, we can have a conversation through the patient portal, you know, um, a week or two later if we're not in and updating us on how is that progress and getting to see someone um, can be helpful for us too. So we just know where you're at and you're not just lost in the shuffle, so to speak. Good. Um, I have some questions again, Dana and Ben. As parents of teenagers, how about keeping teenagers safe when all they want to do is be with their friends? It's causing some conflict. The teenagers are motivated by being social and being with their friends, and they're not afraid of catching COVID. How can we keep them happy and not depressed while maintaining that safety for parents, grandparents, and for the community? How do we keep our teenagers on board? What tips do you have as parents of teenagers? I guess, again, for us, I go back to that, yeah, okay, maybe you're not worried about you, and in general, young people, for the most part, what we know do well with this virus, but what you do affects others, so, like, when you want to go walk up to King Supers from the park with your friends, you need to keep, you may not be wearing your mask hanging out outside, and you're, but you need to have a mask in your pocket that you put on that you wear when you walk in to get your snacks or go in. I don't know. So we, those, that's just like a really simple thing at my house because they're hanging out outside. A lot of times it's going to, and they're alone, 15, 16, 18 year olds are not wearing masks. I would imagine, you know, it'd be great if they did, but at least when you're interacting or close to other people and thinking about how this COVID really does affect older people or people with underlying illness, kind of trying them to have them step out of their own world and think about how it impacts others, I guess. I think that's, that's the spot on as far as having teenagers, you can give them an example about what if, you know, it, the scenarios with someone who is vulnerable, they know and they have, you know, love. So I think that's good. And it's, um, and also we just have to back up sometimes too to go, um, this, all the stuff that we're doing is to slow it down. And so it's nothing is going to be perfect. They're not, their actions are not going to be perfect as teenagers sometimes, but they can be um, thoughtful for others, but it's not going to be perfect. And it just can't be. It's just, it's, it's not really meant to be that way. It's meant to be a slowdown of what's going on too. And so we have to take that, you know, step back sometimes if we're getting on our, our kids are trying to be with their, their friends and say, Hey, these are the deals. These are the set rules we have right now that we're going to all follow, you know, and you, you trust that hopefully they're following those rules too. But I think Dana had it spot on where you start, if you start thinking about outside of yourself of those others, that's, that's, that's going to be the power for all of us to, to do well. You know, sometimes I find that it's all really helpful. Um, I, sometimes I find that if you turn it around, as you both mentioned, and help them see, you know, what do you think when little kids look up to you? You know that little kids in our neighborhood look up to you. Your little brothers and sisters look up to you. What do you think they think when they see you not wearing the mask? Um, you know, because sometimes teenagers don't realize they can they actually have a great deal of power. Part of what the issue is, they want more power, they want more control. But when you help them see they already have a great deal of power to be a role model in their community, a role model on their street, in their family. Um, and when you point out, and when we ask, what is it you'd like to see happen this fall? Would you like to be able to still get out? Would you like to go to the store? Would you like to go to the movie theater that's about to open? Would you like for your school to still be open so you can see your friends then? Um, for that to be able to happen means that our administrators and our teachers and the clerks at the store have to be healthy. They have to be healthy to stay. And wearing the mask is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of respect. I want to help protect these people so I can still have at least this kind of life moving forward. 
And I think outdoor get togethers are a real reasonable, low risk, high reward opportunity. You know, outside in areas where the air can dilute the virus, we, we know that's not zero risk, but it's far less risk. So helping them, helping meet them halfway to figure it out and helping them see this isn't just us trying to control you. This isn't just society trying to make rules about you. This is your opportunity to really make an impact, be an example, and help our community survive this and at least be able to do a few things. college bound kids who needed to get that vaccine if they'll call this week we'll get them in they're high 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 priority because they're getting ready to leave town and uh, the rest of the families we're going to do kids and parents uh, in flu clinics that we're getting ready to set up right now because the shipment came a few days earlier than we expected which is great and let's see i'm looking occupational therapy is an alternative way to address you know meditation, uh, horseback riding, hiking, getting out in nature, um, occupational therapy for um, special needs kids, if we can get that, um, those are gonna be helpful things as well. Anyway, uh, we appreciate that you all have tuned in. We are very thankful for your thoughtful questions. And we will try to get to some of those that we were not able to answer and figure out a way to post those on Partners in Pediatrics blog. Um, for those of you who need to get in, give us a call. We'll get you set up. We'll talk, we talk about COVID at every single well care and sick care now to some extent because it's on everyone's mind. And personal thank you to Stacy, uh, to Children's Hospital, uh, to Ben Rose, who helped us out with uh, getting the planning for this, and to my panel. I really appreciate your expertise. Thank you, folks. Stay safe. Keep doing a great job with your mask and your distancing, and make time to enjoy your family, to find the little silver linings, if there are any at all, in this time that we're close together. Um, try to look forward to some things. Uh, it will eventually get better. It's going to be a while. But if we do what we are doing right now in Colorado, we'll keep each other safe and healthy and we'll be able to come on the other side of this um, intact with amazing stories to tell our grandchildren and great-grandchildren someday. Take care and good night, folks. <laughs>